Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to discuss an introduction to inferences based on one sample. My name is Fred Rispoli and I'm coming to you from Stony Brook University. So we're going to look at various inferences based on one sample. Uh, one type are inferences for means. These are based on the normal distribution and the T distribution. In terms of tests, we'll call these Z test and T test. We'll also look at inferences for proportions. Again, these are also based on the normal distribution. And we're going to uh, take a look at proportion tests. And the last type will be inferences for variances and standard deviations. These are based on the chi-square distribution and the hypothesis test would be a chi-square test. Now, in each of these categories, we're interested in constructing confidence intervals, determining sample size, and running hypothesis tests, as well as determining errors associated with tests um, such as beta. For example, the probability of a type 2 error. This is known as beta. Some of the key ideas in chapter 8 are, well, only one sample will be in use and when we run test we will also be given a, a target value and so the results from our sample we will be compared to the target value. All of the inferences require the use of tables. And so in this chapter, we'll need to be familiar with the normal distribution table, the T distribution table, and the chi-square table. Now it's important to keep in mind that the conclusions we reach are based on the data. Nothing is formally proved in the rigorous mathematical sense. And even more along these lines, we could say inferences are obtained from the sample data, and from this, we're making claims about a population. And we do know that errors are possible, but we try to use probability to understand how likely it is that an error is being made. So here's our roadmap for hypothesis tests. Um, assuming these uh, data sets that we're working are normal, we're interested in tests involving one sample, and you can see sort of how this breaks down over here. So in this chapter 8, we'll be covering the left branch of this tree, and then in chapter 9, we'll cover the right branch of the tree. Okay, just a reminder... Uh, when we run hypothesis tests, there's really five steps that we need to address. We uh, set up the hypotheses, the null hypothesis, and the alternative. Try to identify the claim. Very important to set up these hypotheses correctly. Determine alpha, usually given in the textbook. Choose the test statistic formula and identify the critical regions or the rejection region. This is where we need to use our table and, and typically we have to look up these values. In step four, we substitute the values that we get from our sample in the test statistic formula and then make a decision whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. I call that the statistical conclusion. And then in step five, we give the p-value. Uh, you could use this to confirm the conclusion that you obtained in step four. And then also in step five, we try to give a practical conclusion in the context of the original question. We'll be looking at many examples of this hypothesis testing in some other videos. Here I'm just sort of giving you a, a quick overview of chapter 8. So when inferences for mu 
are desired and sigma is known, then uh, one possibility is we want a confidence interval. Okay, so if we know that our uh, our data set is normal, okay, and sigma is known, we could use this type of formula to find our confidence interval. So we get our x bar from the sample data, and then this term over here, this is called our error term. We find z alpha over 2 in our normal distribution table. And then we take the standard deviation over the square root of n. So I recalculate the error term, and then we subtract that from x bar. And over here, we would add it. So that would give us our confidence interval. If we wanted to determine a sample size so that in our confidence interval, the maximum error is this value e, okay, then we could use z alpha over 2. Remember, this is the z value from a normal distribution that leaves alpha over 2, let's say, in the right tail. So we take this, this z term times sigma, divide by e, and then this gets squared. And we have to remember this gets rounded up to the nearest whole number. If we need to run a hypothesis test, then we use the z test statistic. So z is x bar minus mu naught. This is the hypothesized mean divided by sigma over the square root of n. And we would calculate this and then compare this to the critical values that we would look up from our normal distribution table. Now, there are also formulas for finding the correct sample size of a hypothesis test. We have to remember that this formula given up here is the sample size for a confidence interval. But if we're running a hypothesis test, there's a, a different formula that we need to, to look at. Um, and there's also some important formulas for calculating the uh, probability of a type 2 error, which is beta. I did not put these formulas here, but you could find those formulas either in my class notes or in the textbook. Now, another case that we're interested in is inferences concerning a mean when sigma is unknown. Okay, but let's say the sample size is still greater than or equal to 30. Okay, so in this case, we use nearly identical formulas uh, to what I just showed you. It's just we'll use s instead of sigma. So what I mean here using s is you are either given a sample standard deviation or you might be given the actual data from the data you would find the sample standard deviation. Then we go back to these same formulas we were looking at, and we simply use s up here instead of sigma that we had before. And similarly, we could run a hypothesis test calculating a z-test statistic. Only difference is here we have s instead of sigma. So this is very close to what we did in the first case. Now, things start to get a little bit different when we want to obtain some sort of inference for a mean when sigma is unknown and n is less than 30, right? So both of these things have to happen. In this case, our confidence interval is calculated using the formula that you see here. So now the big difference is this term here comes from a t distribution, and it's a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we get t alpha over 2. So this is the value in the t distribution that leaves alpha over 2 in the right tail. You could look this up in the t distribution table. Use n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And then the algebra is, is really identical to what we were doing before. We have s over the square root of n. 
So we would figure out this error term subtracted from X bar, and then over here we add it to X bar. And similarly, if we need to run a hypothesis test concerning a mean, and we have a small sample size, then we use T is equal to X bar minus mu naught over S divided by the square root of N. Our critical values would come from the T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. Again, you'll see examples of this in a, um, a follow-up video I call chapter eight examples video. Now another type of proportion that we are, well another type of inference that we're interested in are the proportions. The idea with a proportion is underlying the proportion is a binomial random variable but we convert this so that we could use our normal distribution to make inferences. So if we want a confidence interval, you could see we find p hat. Now p hat is the sample proportion. So this would be the number of successes divided by n. So we get p hat. This is our z alpha over two term. So this we get from our normal distribution same way we did uh, in the previous few cases. And then we have p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. So we would work this fraction out and take the square roots, multiply by z alpha over 2. That would give us our error term. And then we subtract it from p hat and add it to p hat. One should also check that n times p hat is greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p hat is greater than or equal to 10. So this is sort of an assumption of this method, and when we have these conditions, we know that using the normal distribution is a, a safe and reasonable thing to do. If we want to estimate the sample size, for the confidence interval, we could use either this formula over here. So this is used when we have some sort of preliminary estimate, P, of our proportion. Or more conservative approach is instead of P times 1 minus P, we simply use 1 fourth. And then we have Z alpha over 2 divided by E. This expression gets squared. And if we're running a hypothesis test, then we could actually calculate a Z test statistic using our proportions. So here we have P hat. So that is our sample proportion minus P naught. That's our hypothesized proportion over this here, the square root P naught times 1 minus P naught over N. Okay, and finally, the last type of inference that we're going to sort of address in this chapter are the inferences for variance and standard deviation. So <clears throat> here we use the, the chi-square statistic n minus 1 times our sample variance over this chi-square value uh, this is the value that leaves an area of alpha over 2 in the right tail, and the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So you can see we have uh, these different terms. Now we have to be careful with the chi-square distribution, because remember the chi-square distributions, well, they look something like this. This is for different degrees of freedom. But the, the main point here is that it's not a symmetric distribution. So we need to look up the chi-square value that leads alpha over 2 to the right. And then this would be the, the chi-square value that leaves 1 minus alpha over 2 to the right. So these do not occur in plus or minus pairs. 
So we have to look both of these up. And finally, we have this hypothesis test statistic for the chi-square. We would have n minus 1 times the sample variance divided by um, a hypothesized uh, population variance. So this provides an overview of Chapter 8. It's what Chapter 8 is all about. There's a lot of information in the course in the textbook and in the class notes. And there are videos that cover many different examples. So thank you for watching.